Absolutely amazing, isn't it? Uh, 20 minutes ago, Nir Zohar spoke about the success of Checkpoint. I have to mention another incredible success, and it is the success of Mobileye by Professor Amnon Shashua, an MIT alum, a Hebrew University professor, a company whose valuation is over $10 billion from, from nowhere. So we are holding our fi uh, fingers crossed for Mobileye as well. And I would like to move to the keynote speech today, where um, the next speaker is Alex Freeland, founder, co-founder, and CEO of an incredible company called Mirantis that's about to change the world of cloud computing. Alex, will you please? All right. Well, good evening, everybody. I appreciate the invitation to talk. Uh, um, so um, um, we were thinking about the name, and uh, um, one of the um, comments that I received is that not everybody knows what a unicorn is. But I've heard the unicorn. Ah, great. Thank you. Um, but I've heard unicorn used here quite a few times, right? So uh, um, in the valley um, where I live, um, the word unicorn was a popular word all the way until now. But if you're trying to say that you're a unicorn um, at the crossover between 15 and 16, it's not a popular word, right? Market is changing, right? So ultimately, the unicorn is not a means to an end. Unicorn is essentially the price at which people are willing to give you debt, but until you actually make it as a company, it really doesn't matter, right? So, um, and um, the market is changing. So it's not about being a unicorn, it's about building a real company that makes a difference. So yes, when you ride a unicorn, ultimately it's how do you make a difference? So what we have um, been trying to do is um, Play in the world of cloud computing, and usually, you know, this is the kind of the first slide I use when we um, talk to our customers, because today the world is moving very, very fast, and um, um, every large company is being potentially disrupted by um, uh, a startup, right? So, you know, service providers, you know, people like you know AT and T's of this world and Vodafone's, uh, they're being disrupted by people like WhatsApp, you know, which is a tiny little company. Um, founded by a, um, a Jewish immigrant from uh, Ukraine um, who was an engineer at Yahoo, built this company um, in you know, two, three years, I think, right? And um, a friend of mine who is sitting over there actually knows him very well and is telling a story that uh, Jan Kuhn was complaining about a year before the sale that the company isn't going anywhere, right? And then a year later, it got sold for $19 billion. Uh, now, it did help that Sequoia... Um, invested in that, and part of the negotiations was done by the guy who knows how to negotiate. But they put in $20 million, I think, at under $100 million pre-money. Uh, so Sequoia did very well for that investment, right? So, but um, um, we've actually talked to Vodafone, and Vodafone told us that uh, they knew how, that they needed to build um, a WhatsApp-like company, but the problem was that in their IT department, Every time you would get a VM, and VM stands for a virtual machine, which is essentially if you want to use a computer to do something, um, the rule was that you have to do a business case that would explain why you would need that virtual machine, and you have to be able to fund it for five years, which means that in Vodafone, to actually do something like a WhatsApp, when you have to try things and you know, build things up and you know, fail and then pivot and all that, which is completely impossible. So as a result, a tiny little company just went and did it and took away all the SMS business from all the telcos, you know, essentially overnight, right? And that's why they have, well, that's one of the reasons they have such a big valuation. But um, it's clear that a tiny little company just took a major business from all the world telcos, right? So, and it's happening across all the industries. 
Why is that happening is because the e-commerce is making it possible for people to reach uh, customers very, very quickly. And the speed with which these small companies are moving is much, much faster than what these large companies can do. And so agility is what's kind of driving this world. And um, 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 a few years ago, um, a retailer uh, called Amazon you know, came up with uh, this thing called AWS that all of us know what it is that really changed the world. It's kind of starting to disrupt the world and they, you know, Amazon just proved to the world that computing could be consumed on demand in a SaaS model um, very, very quickly. And um, a lot of people in you know, small companies and large, mostly developers, started to um, um, consume computing not from their own IT departments, but from some unknown company by just using their credit card. And that was the first time in decades that suddenly a competition to an IT department of a large company just emerged. Because, you know, IT, IT guys are used to kind of owning the keys to the kingdom, right? You need to do something as a big company. Well, you go to your IT department, and there's a guy sitting there. It says, it's great. It's complicated. Wait three months. You know, and you wait three months because there's nothing you can do about it. Well, with Amazon, you could. And developers who are kind of smart guys and, uh, uh, and gals, and they can do things very quickly, they... Um, just went out and said, you know, give me a machine, I'll just code it there, right? And then there was simple API, so I can do this and that service and that, whatever, pay for whatever it is. And the kind of the shadow IT started. And lo and behold, last year, Amazon Web Services was $8 billion market, you know, $8 billion in revenue that came out of nowhere. Now, you have to kind of look at this industry as a whole, and you will see this slide a little bit later as well. But... Um, the whole industry today for data center infrastructure is $130 billion. So it's still, you know, a, you know, a fairly small spec out there. But in, in moreover, if you look at the application infrastructure on top of that, you know, the, on the data center side, this is $300 billion. So $8 billion as opposed to $300 billion, it's still a very, very small, you know, 2 to 3%. And yet, what's happening is this Amazon revolution has the whole... IT industry and the whole infrastructure industry pretty terrified. Now, why? Because, um, you know, Amazon, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud Platform, and uh, Alibaba. I mean, um, let's think about it. How many, what, what's your guess? How many Dell servers did Amazon buy uh, in their service? How many do you think? Any ideas? Huh? I'd say not a lot. I'd say none. No, it's just because they can build very cheap um, compute servers, you know, from China themselves. And how many Cisco routers have they bought? Equally as much, right? None, zero, right? So here it is, and, and so goes for Checkpoint Software, by the way. They haven't bought any. You know, they found their own ways, and, uh, and many, many other, you know. Um, now, if you're Intel, what is, the, what is Intel's mar uh, percentage of chips in the data center servers today? Who can guess? Close. Yeah, it's 100 and it's zero. Zero is, zero is a bad number. 100 is very close. Intel has 96% monopoly in the data uh, center uh, space today. Well, uh, what is the gross margin for Intel's data center business? I'll tell you, it's 68%, right? So you have a $16 billion business with 68% gross margin. That alone basically has, you know, Intel's market cap. That business alone is worth, you know, 100 and whatever, 20, 130 billion dollars, whatever Intel is worth these days. Now, do you think Intel sells to Amazon? The answer is yes, they do because Intel is still the best chip out there. It's very difficult to disrupt. How much is, how much is the margin that Intel gets out of Amazon? Who will guess? 25, close enough, 20%, right? So if all the computing out there will go to Amazon or Amazon-like companies, Intel's 68% gross margin monopoly will go down to 20%, or you know, imagine 
um, our friends from Amazon, you know, grow their business 10x. What's to prevent them to build their own chip? Or to use ARM or give them a lot more money and kind of create something like this. So basically what's happening is these guys will end up building their own stacks, you know, very efficiently. They will innovate at tremendous, tremendous scale, right? They build their data centers next to rivers where the energy is really, really cheap. And they give their customers a wonderful, wonderful experience at a good price on an on-demand model. And all the people who are building infrastructure and creating innovation and storage and network and application infrastructure and firewalls and all that, all these people over there will probably be out of business. The application people will be in business, but these guys will be out of business. Now, that's a, ter that's a terrifying thought, because essentially what this means, you'll have an oligopoly of a number of players. Now, we have this, for example, today in the power industry. Not today, it happened, you know, early part of the uh, 20th century. And those companies who were innovators of the, um, um, of the power industry ended up owning that industry. And then they stopped innovating, they got regulated, and we haven't seen any, any major innovation in the um, uh, power industry for probably 50 years. Until now, the solar just came out and they're trying to do that, right? So it, it, it looks like a good idea and convenience today, but I think in the long term, it's not a good thing, right? So, and certainly all those guys on the right, they're terrified of this. So they need to do something to kind of level the playing field, and that's a big, big challenge. Now, what are, you know, what are these, um, these names? These names are, I took them from a site called OpenStack.org, and these are companies that are backing OpenStack. Now, who in the audience knows what OpenStack is? One, two, and a half, three, four, five. Not a lot. Okay. So um, OpenStack is, an open cloud operating system uh, that is built to enable rapid deployment and operation of cloud workloads, both IT and network, right? That's the definition that I took from the uh, OpenStack website. So OpenStack started as a open source project. Do people know what open source is? How many people know what open source is? Most of you do, okay. So the most um, well-known open source project is Linux, right? which is um, an operating system for a server. Um, and Red Hat is the largest player in that, in that field, right? So Linux started 25 years ago, um, 93, I think, right? And Red Hat went public in 2000-ish uh, or 99 or something like that, and they, they build it. So um, OpenStack is a Linux of the cloud, right? So it's, it's, it's a technology that lives on top of a cloud and takes a lot of disparate hardware that's distributed everywhere in the world you put OpenStack on top of it, and you get yourself an Amazon out of the box, right? So you can build your own Amazon. So it's a platform that allows you to, um, to have a, basically a cloud computing platform with the same or similar experience to that of Amazon. Um, it started uh, in 2010 when uh, NASA and uh, Rackspace open sourced uh, their technology. NASA open sourced their compute engine that they use to calculate the uh, trajectories of asteroids and things like that. And the uh, Rackspace took their object storage called Swift and they created the first two projects called Nova and Swift. And lo and behold, you know, that's how it started. And then the big community was built around it. And um, uh, I'll talk about the community, but uh, as of um, um, a few weeks ago, or a couple of months ago, oh, yeah, less, a uh, month and a half ago in, Jap in Japan, OpenStack brought up a new mission. They said it's a single platform for bare metal virtual machines and containers with the different types of workloads that you can possibly run in cloud computing. So one platform for all possible workloads and an integration engine for every cloud technology that matters for the next decade and beyond, right? So it's a very, very ambitious goal that this open source community is trying to achieve, which is create a platform that will be, you know, one platform to run anything that you'd like, and whatever innovation is coming in, cloud computing from all those small companies that you saw, some of them are very large, and those who haven't even been born yet, OpenStack is there to integrate and deliver to the customers in an easy to consume way. So that's the only way to have an answer 
to Amazon and Google Compute Engine and et cetera, right? So that's what the mission of this project is. Now, I told you it's five years old, so there is uh, 32,000 people are involved with this. There's 550 companies, 177 uh, countries, um, and more than 20 million lines of code all over the world. So it's actually a very, very large community. I think it's one of the probably top five open source communities ever. And it took five years to get there. Now, I happen to be a chairman of the finance committee of the OpenStack Foundation. I can tell you that the budget for the foundation, for marketing and everything else that they do, is this year is $23 million. Now, it's like it's a mother of all foundations, really, because Linux, that is 25 years of age, I think their budget is $10 million. So that thing is growing like, you know, the fastest, the, on the fastest trajectory ever uh, because there are so many stakeholders who just need to see it succeed. So with that, um, just a glimpse of what OpenStack is. And I think this has little, yeah. So this, this is from a site called Stackalytics. So what Stackalytics shows you is that um, there are different modules in OpenStack, right? So Neutron is a module that deals with networking, and then there's a compute module and storage and deployment and identity and so on and so forth. So whatever you need, you know, to be there to run, you know, to have a cloud computing stack, OpenStack will provide. Then what you would see here is, um, is these are the companies that are contributing to OpenStack. This is from the first... Um, two months of the latest release called Mitaka. And releases are named um, um, alphabetically, and they're based on the, uh, on the cities uh, where a summit took place. So Mitaka sounds Japanese because the latest summit was in Tokyo. So you will see that there is 119 companies that are contributing, and the top 10 are you know, companies like HP, IBM, Red Hat, and the Huawei, Intel. Suzy is the old company that's called, you know, that was called, used to be called uh, Novell. And this is a um, emerging Chinese company. And of course, number one company is Mirantis, which is the company that uh, I represent here. Uh, so we decided um, about five years ago, a little less than five years ago, that we wanted to become um, an operating system company. And the reason we did that is, you know, Mirantis was actually founded quite a while ago. We were um, a service provider. Um, an outsourcing company. You can hear my um, Russian accent. I was uh, born um, in Moscow many, many years ago. Uh, a Jewish refusenik who spent, uh, you know, with my parents a few years waiting for the, the, the curtain to, to lift, you know, uh, went to America, not to Israel. Um, heard what Sahnu thought about it when I landed in Austria. Um, but, um, um, well, um, been uh, a frequent guest to Israel, love being here, think of it as my second home, really. So, But um, um, I started uh, Mirantis uh, in 2000, first as an outsourcing company um, that took advantage of the very, very specialized Russian talent. And uh, <laughs> just as an anecdote, my first three customers in Mirantis were Israeli executives working in the Valley, who um, I didn't have to convince that Russian engineering talent is actually great. Right, because they're used to the fact that every third engineer that they used to work in Israel was Russian, so they were sold. I just had to sell them on a business model. Whereas I go to an American guy, they would kind of listen to me and say, hmm, business model is interesting. Russia, uh-huh. <laughs> right, so um, took took a while. So, but, um, but the first three customers kind of proved the model, and then we kind of scaled the company a little bit. Did that until... Uh, late 2008, when um, Lehman collapsed, and we realized, you know, a customer base kind of went down, and we realized that we don't want to be in the labor arbitrage business, and instead, we said, let's find a technology wave uh, that we can, you know, use our talent base against. And the technology wave, I said, ah, let's try cloud computing. We had no idea what cl cloud computing was, so we just went in, you know, found a couple of people, got into a couple of projects, got into Macy's.com, into PayPal, they were building um, clouds. And two years later, when we sort of realized that we became somewhat cloud aware, we also realized that cloud is not really a technology. Cloud is a whole different way to consume computing, where the barrier to entry into computing goes down by at least an order of magnitude, and that will be a beginning of a brand new industry. Now, as a computer science major and somebody who kind of likes computing, 
I kind of looked back and said, hmm, we've seen that movie before, right? And the last time we saw that movie at that scale was when um, IBM PC started. And uh, um, the barrier to entry into computing went down you know, to the PC level, because it's a couple of thousand dollars a box you know, prior to the big boxes that you could buy from IBM and all that. And that ushered the new revolution of client server and everything else and you know, the world as we know it today. And how did it happen? What, how, did, how do you play that game? And the way you play that game is you start by somebody doing the, the box, like Apple did, right? And they kind of show the device that kind of works. And then you do a Microsoft thing, which is you disintermediate hardware and software. You create the bottom layer, which is an operating system layer, right? And then with that, you go out and you build the operating system layer, you win that game, and then you go up and you build the whole stack. And that's how Microsoft was born, and then after that, that's how Red Hat was born and all those other guys. So the playbook was clear. So we said, great, cloud computing is starting. It's a disruption in the industry. Let's find an operating system. So what's an operating system for the cloud? Well, the operating system for the cloud was an IIS, infrastructure as a service, because cloud is like a virtual computer, so infrastructure as a service will give you compute storage and network as a service, so it is an operating system. Great. What should be the operating system like uh, in order to compete in the world of Amazons? So Amazon is like an Apple, right? So it's a great thing, it's unified, it's wonderful, but Apple didn't win at that time. Why? Because of the disintermediation, the openness, and the, uh, the ecosystem that was built around it. So two things we needed to have. One, it needed to be extremely open, and the other, it needed to have a large community ecosystem. And these two parameters were a lot more important than any of the technologies that were existing at the time. Because once you have that, there'll be resources, there'll be money, there'll be people, there'll be customers, and when you have resources, um, you can build anything. So technology is truly secondary. So, and also, why does it have to be open? Because there are good technologies out there that actually outperform technologically, um, in, you know, the, um, the other, you know, open alternatives. And the reason it had to be open is because the only way to win this game is to build an economically compelling equation where you can actually beat Amazons of this world. So, Amazon, again, continues to innovate at tremendous scale. They drive prices down every portion of the stack, right, by taking extraneous things and throwing them out. And um, to win against that, you need to unleash the innovation of the whole world that will continue to do that and make sure it can flow unabated into uh, the stack without anybody telling you whether or not it can or cannot be part of that stack. Now, if you have a proprietary vendor owning the platform, the proprietary vendor will end up deciding which you know, um, partner is allowed to be part of it. So for example, VMware is a similar technology. Now, if you are VMware, you control all the partners, for example, in storage. You decide which storage vendors you want to go with. And by the way, you're owned mostly by EMC or now Dell. Right, so EMC, of course, is a big storage company. So how amenable will you be to a disruptive storage vendor who just comes in and wants to sell storage at 10 times cheaper than EMC? Well, not very, right? But if it's an open thing, you don't have to ask permission of anybody. Just go and do it, create a couple of use cases, and you're done. How many of you heard of a company called Ceph? One, two, Think Tank, right, exactly. So. There was a company a few years ago that uh, actually spun out from a company called DreamHost uh, where they built um, software-defined storage. That had done a very good job, um, and they said, hey, let's make a company out of it. So they spun it out, open-sourced it, went out, created a driver for OpenStack, used five companies that used OpenStack, made Ceph available to them as a... Um, um, as a use case, showed that it's 10 times better than anything out there, including anything that EMC ever had. And lo and behold, you know, started exponential adoption. Um, I'd say 15 months later from the time they started, Red Hat bought them for $200 million. I think they used $5 million in funding or something, or eight, of which five was debt, 
right? So um, we were really, really unhappy because Red Hat bought them. But that's an example of what can happen, how you can create value in this open ecosystem. Now, if they went to VMware and tried to do the same thing over there, what would it look like? Well, the first thing they would need to do is to convince VMware that these guys are good. So the first thing they would do is they would go to a whole bunch of customers, uh, hire very, very expensive salespeople who are like half a million dollars a person, you know, take 30 uh, six-month sales cycles, get three customers, prove them over there that they work, and then once they did, they will have burned $30 million just to get there, and then if they did, they would have been raising round C, and probably EMC would have bought them for $100 million, jacked up the price 10x, and we would have another successful storage exit. Like we have many, Scale.io, Israeli company, did exactly that, right? So we know that. And uh, Scale.io now is trying with, with EMC's channel, trying to compete with Ceph, and it's losing. Ceph is actually winning the battle because it's a bottoms up. And we're actually benefiting from it because the competitors of Red Hat, EMC in particular, wants to work with us you know, to push um, Scale.io now that they own, right? So, so anyhow, so this is, you know, the whole landscape. So what we decided then is we need to find an open operating system, open IIS, that had a big community around it. And we looked around and we saw Eucalyptus and we saw CloudStack and we saw uh, Open Nimbula and a bunch of other things. Eucalyptus was owned by Eucalyptus. CloudStack was owned by Citrix. Um, others were owned by somebody else. OpenStack had no owner and a huge community building on it and the worst technology out there. So we said, uh-huh, that's our train. And we became an OpenStack company. When we announced this to our engineers, about 5% of them quit. They said the management is incompetent, technology doesn't work, you guys don't know what you're doing. And we said, guys, come on, it's not an engineering problem. You know, if we have the resources, smart people like you can actually fix it. Well, those who um, agreed saw us go from a $5 million market cap you know, to close to a billion, right? So they've, they've, they've kind of ridden that wave. Um, so, so that's how we became, in, in April of 2001, we made a decision to become an OpenStack company, and so we did. So I need to click. So now let me talk about Mirantis a little bit. So today, um, we are the largest pure play OpenStack company. Now, but by pure play, what that means is the only thing we do is OpenStack, right? Because OpenStack is essentially all of computing stack, and by computing, I mean storage and network and, and compute and everything else. It's the full stack, right? And, and workload management and orchestration and all that. What we do is we provide that stack. What we don't do is we don't provide anything above, beyond, underneath, or inside. So we just commoditize the thing, and that's what we give you. And that's very important, because um, a lot of people need OpenStack. Why? If you want to sell your storage, you need a platform to sell it through. If you want to sell your compute, you need a platform to sell it through. But imagine you're a large customer, and you need to buy a platform that then you can use you know, to consume a lot of storage. Would you buy it from a storage company? Well, no, because if you would like to buy it from a storage company, a storage company will give it to you, the platform, for free because they will tie you to their storage, and then you're going to be stuck with their storage, and other storage will magically not work as well, right? So the pure play thing means the customer who buys it has control over um, you know, what infrastructure providers you can pick and what things on top you can choose. And the agnosticism is extremely important, and that makes all the difference, really, right? So in this, in this, in this ecosystem, being agnostic and pure play is extremely important. So we started with about 10 other startups. Um, we did a different game and, um, you know, than they. Uh, we started with the services motion, whereas everybody else started with the product motion. And when you start with the product motion, it's very difficult to guess where the market is going. And especially if it's a big ecosystem play like this, guessing is really, really difficult because you have no idea what customers will use it for. So what we did is we said, okay, we'll just go find um, you know, 20 most innovative customers and just do it for them and learn from them. And then when we see a pattern, we'll automate and build a product. We've done it that way. 
And by the time the first 50 OpenStack use cases were published, 30 of them had our signature on that. That established us as a leader. Then, you know, a few years later, we raised some more money. All the other pure plays couldn't do it. They got acquired very quickly, and we became the, the largest pure play. We've gotten another couple of hundred million dollars into our bank account. And so now we are a potential disruptor, you know, to the status quo, to the big guys, right? So, um, so you know, Intel um, Capital led our first round. Intel Corporate led our B2 round. Now, Intel Corporate is very important because remember what I said about, um, um, about the foundational thing? You know, 96% of all the... Um, uh, computers in the data center run Intel. So Intel is very interested in OpenStack, right? And so what they did is they, um, they took a large percentage in us, they gave us all their R&D roadmap, and they said, Mirantis, let's work together to make sure OpenStack really works on what we have today and tomorrow. That credential does quite a bit. So all the other OEMs now are coming to us because we're being named by the biggest player, you know, the standard. And, um, you know, Intel's been doing this traditionally, right? So in the days of Linux, they've done it with Red Hat. In the days of um, virtualization, they've done it with uh, VMware. In the days of, um, of Hadoop, they've done it with Cloudera, right? And for open cloud, they chose us. So it's a, it's a, very, it's a very big deal. Um, we grew our business in OpenStack from $300,000 um, in 2011 to a little over 50 million this year with about a 65% year-to-year growth. So, knock on wood, uh, we're doing good. Uh, we have about 200 customers, um, and we're focusing on four geographies, US, UK, Germany, Japan, and China. Now, why would be those five? Who can guess? Yes, these are the top five companies by, uh, the five economies by IT spend, right? So we need to focus, so we're focusing on these five. We can't do beyond that. So we had uh, folks from, uh, from Israel call us and say, hey, uh, how about we start something in Israel? I said, R&D, yes, but market-wise, a little later, right? And uh, um, um, we, have, we have to focus. And then, you know, we have key partnerships. Ericsson is a very important partnership. Their uh, cloud execution environment for telcos has Mirantis and OpenStack built in. Because of scale I.O. and uh, Ceph story, I told you, EMC is very bullish in reselling our stuff. Pivotal, which is, um, you know, Cloud Foundry, one of the passes, is a big, is a big use case. And we'll have more. Um, in the meantime, we've also become the number one OpenStack contributor. Today, a lot of our technology has been accepted into OpenStack, and we do about 25% of all OpenStack development is done by us. So it gives us tremendous credibility. Um, some of our customers, um, again, you know, by, by verticals and uh, some of the largest companies in the world, and that's important, I'll explain why. Uh, some of the companies in the last uh, three quarters, it doesn't have our Q4 yet. Uh, you can see, you know, some of the big Chinese players, uh, um, you know, uh, various industries. Um, so, the world is starting to get around. Um, so this, I just stumbled um, over this um, in, um, you know, uh, like a month ago, uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, Business Insider named us the fifth uh, most, uh, what is it, um, uh, top 50 enterprise startup to bet your career on, right? So um, that means that people working for Mirantis actually have a, you know, it's a good company to work for. But that's not what, what I saw. I saw this name, Cloud Operating System Giant. So we're far from being a giant, very far from being a giant. But the person who did this, um, her name is Julie Board, um, actually created um, um, a story that made us infamous and uh, uh, put us on the map. Um, when we won a contract with PayPal, um, um, Julie wrote an article saying that um, because of Mirantis and our project Fuel, PayPal has removed VMware from all of its data center, and therefore OpenStack is going to go all the way. And we woke up to a whole barrage of news. We were on CNBC. 
um, um, because uh, VMware stock was down two and a half billion at that day. And people were saying, VMware stock is down because Mirantis has released fuel and one of the customers, PayPal, has suggested that uh, they're no longer going to be using VMware for OpenStack, which was far from truth at the time. So what happened then was the CEO of VMware called um, CEO of um, eBay and said, what the hell? That guy called the CEO of PayPal and said, what's going on? That guy called our VP champion and said, who the hell is Mirantis? Um, and so, and Adrian, whom you, whom you saw, who was our CEO at the time, you know, called Boris, who is uh, my co-founder and a marketing dude, and said, why are you doing this? It's my reputation and your company's reputation. So there was a huge scandal, but after that, everybody knew us. And Boris said, insisted, listen, this is, you know, uh, you know, maybe a little bit aggressive, but this is what you need for marketing. Uh, well, what happened two years later, PayPal announced that VMware is out and 100% of PayPal's business is running on OpenStack. So it was true, but two years early. So what I'm hoping is that Julie Board, you know, it's, again, it's true, but two years early. <laughs> so, um, but let's kind of take a look at who are, who are we competing with. So um, some of the accounts that we won, uh, AT&T and Verizon, you know, those are two largest telcos in, in the US. And I'll, I'll give you an example of AT&T in the next slide. We're competing against HP and won. Um, this name should be confidential. Uh, this is actually Saudi Telecom. Uh, we've competed against Red Hat and um, won. Uh, Sberbank is the largest bank in Russia. We competed against IBM and won. And Shenzhen Stock Exchange is the largest financial cloud. It's a NASDAQ of uh, China. There were three people in the finals, IBM, HP, and us, and we won. Right, so we, whenever we go into a deal, and by the way, you have to understand that there are, there are hundreds of deals out there, big and small, that we don't even know exist because we don't have a brand now you know, like these guys do. So, but when we go against these guys at those massive, massive, massive deals, we are capable of winning. And those are fundamental deals. I'll explain what, what it is, and then I'll explain why we're winning. But this is also interesting. So Red Hat, of course, is the largest open source company in the world. This is three months ago uh, from uh, Jim Whitehurst was talking to Wall Street. And he was asked about what's happening in OpenStack and who their competition is. And this is from that, you know, interview, right? So. Mirantis, I mean Microsoft, HP, and Mirantis. Uh, so, um, and again, Microsoft is actually good. Uh, HP, they don't really see, but Mirantis, they do, and they compete with us head to head. Now, this is the best thing that can happen to a company like us, where a $15 billion market cap leader, CEO, is credentialing us in front of 60 or so um, analysts uh, on Wall Street, right? So. It's important that they see us as competition, that give us a lot of credibility. But why do we win? So here's one example, just happened this quarter. We won the top three automaker, right? $200 billion in revenue, um, was a heavily contested deal. They decided that all of their cloud computing is gonna be based on OpenStack. Um, and you understand that uh, now the connected cars are coming to bear, and so you have to have a lot of information and processing, having to live on the cloud, and it's not something they want to send to Amazon. So they said OpenStack, in the finals it came down to us and Red Hat, and after a big bake-off um, of about seven weeks, we ended up winning this deal for two reasons. One is our technology worked better than theirs, so that's important. But that's not enough. The second one is the pure play agnosticism. So RHEL and Red Hat, you know, build a vertical stack, which means that everything that has RHEL in it works wonderfully. But if you have VMware, or you don't have RHEL, or you have something else, it's not something that Red Hat is focusing on. Very large, very strategic enterprises want to have a choice of various technologies. They buy companies, they integrate companies, they have a platter of technologies and they want to have one platform that will support it all. Red Hat is actually, you know, its business is to sell Red Hat stack. So for large and very, very diversified companies, it's not really a um, strategy 
to, um, to buy something from a vertical vendor in the cloud computing world. And that's what allows a small company like us to win a behemoth. This is actually the largest automaker in the world now, and we're able to win this kind of deal. So that's how you build the company. You, you win some of those deals, you make them work at scale, you gain credibility, and you know, we'll, we'll talk about this. Uh, likewise, AT&T, which is one of the top two telcos in, in the US, I mean, they are in the existential survival game against Amazon. Because AT&T and any telco, they're in the business of providing infrastructure that people can use for communications, you know, and IT. Now, Amazon is in a similar business, right? So unless these guys can figure out a way to do it at the same scale as Amazon and the same price and agility as Amazon, they're not going to be in AT&T five years or 10 years from now. So they need to change. They need to have a large horizontal platform that they can then drive technology you know, from vendors, control the price, you know, put different innovation on top very, very quickly. So we had a monumental battle with HP against that. And HP, of course, is an integrated vendor. They have HP storage, they have HP compute, they have HP everything. And ultimately, AT&T said, you know what? HP is very respected, we love their servers, we love pieces of technology, but we cannot trust HP to give us a horizontal problem. We need a pure play. And tiny little Mirantis won against Meg Whitman personally, who was lobbying for this deal. So, um, so these are, now, what's important here is um, that you know, to build a technology like this, to build a platform of this magnitude and scale, is extremely, extremely difficult. And when you look at the amount of money and innovation that people like Microsoft and Google and Amazon are putting into building that technology, it's, it's, it's very large. It's thousands of people, hundreds of millions of dollars, probably billions of dollars overall. And there is no way, even with a $200 million funding, a company like Mirantis can possibly touch anything like that. So uh, in order to win, first of all, it's very important that, and you know, to the point that we've discussed, um, you know, some of those was touched upon here, do we need to out-innovate those guys? And the answer is not really. It's not an innovation game. It's actually a commoditization game. Because innovation is something that creates the market, and then the market needs to have good enough solutions at a price that is competitive overall at scale. So Amazon can do it on one end. Vertical vendors cannot do it. So ultimately, what we need to do is we need to build a platform that's good enough, make sure it works very, very well, easy to consume, and the economics of it are as compelling or better across the whole horizontal spectrum than Amazon. And if we do it a little bit later, that's OK. So it's not about out-innovating Amazon. It will never happen. But it's about staying close enough and doing it in such a way that the dependency on Amazon is much less. So it's not really a technology game. It's actually an ecosystem and politics and psychology. And you know, so to build a platform company that we're trying to do, um, in, you know, innovation is just a piece of that. And uh, that, that is a very different concept um, that we have, to, we have to embrace as a technology company to, you know, to, win, to win in this game. So as part of this, we have to also understand that since we cannot go it alone, we have to find other people who will have similar interests, either horizontally or into the pieces of the stack, and convince them to donate their work, their IP, into OpenStack for free, which is, again, a very unnatural thing to do. You know, we're having, actually, certain discussions with uh, folks here in Israel. And it's been a long and arduous discussion to say, guys, you're not going to win here on innovation. But you win here on you know, commoditizing this, creating a marketing train, and then building around it. Because the cost of selling your product is actually much, 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 much larger than the money you can spend uh, in R&D. Right? So if you take your R&D, you donate it to a train that's moving very, very fast, you attach yourself to it, the marketing benefit you're going to get from that donation is a thousand times more than the benefit you're going to get from the differentiation of your IP. Because to sell your differentiated IP will cost you a lot of money. 
People won't know you exist. You need to spend money in marketing. You need to go international. I mean, and that's why in Israel, when you go the innovative game, you build something that's great, then somebody large with channels buys you, and that's how you make your money. But going beyond that is that difficult. So this is one of such ways. You attach yourself to a very, very large moving train. You use your brilliant, innovative things as a way to get in. Right? You become part of that organism, and then when this organism is consumed and looked into and with all that, they see your DNA all over, and that's how you get customers' attention, and then you find ways to monetize it. So that is, you know, it, certainly in the computing in the cloud stack, this is a much better way for a smaller company, less funded company, more innovative company, but you know, not having these kind of channels, to build an independent company. So again, it's, it, it's somewhat of a business model innovation. And, and we who are kind of the, the foundational player in this platform, we are doing two things. One is we have to kind of move this, 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 this platform into the right direction. And other, we have to convince the right players for the right reasons to donate this. And so we have this whole, um, this whole um, um, kind of co-development model uh, that one that we started with Intel, for example, when they gave us $100 million, they gave it to us because they wanted to co-innovate and make OpenStack a lot better, right? But then there are others now who are coming in. So because we are number one contributor and, and the agnostic contributor, we don't have an agenda, we are the most trustworthy and influential people in OpenStack. We bring you know, people like Intel with us to actually make this platform um, you know, able to compete with the Microsofts of this world, right? So through this model. And Intel, for example, you know, the $100 million deal we've done with them, there is very, very specific roadmap how to make storage better and networking and scale and hardening and security and cloud lifecycle and workload management. And then we can go to folks like AT&T and Verizon and others and say, see, you can get that for free. But by the way, you know, don't assume that OpenStack is just there ready for you. You know, it's not. But leaders will make it ready, so it's moldable. And therefore, AT&T, why don't you come in and mold it yourself? So AT&T next year uh, is planning to actually put in um, you know, 50 to 100 people into the community and start molding it, right? And then there are others who are coming in. I'll show you some names. So again, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of coming to an end of my story. Um, the, um, the way you know, cloud computing is kind of shaping up, right? So traditional IT always used to focus on things like you know, predictable, monolithic, you know, really resilient. And vendors like VMware and Microsoft kind of made that IT work really well. And then the cloud world started with Amazon Web Services that actually showed that it's possible to do things very quickly. Things need to change very quickly. And all these models didn't work. And um, Gartner has come up with a paradigm called bimodal IT, where they said that there are two pieces to the puzzle in every IT organization. One is the old world that's moving very, very slow. And then there is a new world of WhatsApps or something like that that has to move a lot faster. And these two worlds must be separate. One doesn't lead to another. All the processes, all the people, all the everything should be different. And um, Every large organization these days must have both modes of IT, the old traditional and the new mode too. And Amazon kind of ushered in this, uh, this world of, uh, of the second phase of IT, and OpenStack is doing the same thing on-prem. Right? So Amazon is actually taking everything away from the IT organizations, and OpenStack is kind of trying to keep it in. So um, again, remembering that this is just a little thing. There's a huge industry that's there. We believe that it actually needs a, um, a disruptor of this, um, of this industry, you know, the, 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 um, the open alternative. And OpenStack is to be that. So we're trying to make OpenStack that platform. And so what Mirantis is trying to achieve here is, you know, to be that platform company. So that's the game we're in, right? And so what does it mean? The platform standard, you know, what does it mean to build a platform company? There are, there are two parts to it, and I usually have animation here, but this is PDF, so you, you can see the whole thing. So our OpenStack needs to be the dominant operating system for developing and running cloud apps, right? So there are 
two parts to that strategy. First is OpenStack must win in cloud, which by the way is a tall order and it's not, you know, it, it may or may not happen. We're working to make sure it does happen. And then the second one is Mirantis must, must win in OpenStack. So um, what does it mean? So I'll start with the second one, right? So Mirantis must win an open stack is anybody who goes and does open stack is looking at how resilient it is, how easy it is to operate, and then pure play is extremely important. And in the last four years, we've done a very good job in being a very credible player in open stack. So today there are really two players left. It's us and Red Hat. Uh, we're tiny. Red Hat is a $15 billion open source juggernaut. But the world knows that in OpenStack, those who are interested in OpenStack, it's really these two who are credible. So we've done a very good job already. So now, going forward, we're actually focusing on making OpenStack win in the cloud. Because even if we stay number two and OpenStack becomes a big winner, it's still a multi, 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 you know, tens of billions of dollars that we can build out of this company because the market is just so big. Um, so what does it take for OpenStack to win? In cloud, the power is shifting from um, um, IT folks to developers because developers are developing very, very quickly. Things they develop on the cloud are running in the cloud, right? And so developers are deciding on what platforms to write, what applications will run next. And so the platform needs to win uh, the, the, you know, the developer attention and it has to accelerate developer productivity. Remember the example with WhatsApp? Developers in Vodafone couldn't do it. So we have to have a platform that will really work well with developers. It needs to have what's called the next gen architecture, which means that there could be one platform for bare metal VMs and containers, which is all kinds of workloads run on the cloud. And finally, it needs to be able to live in an environment like AT&T and evolve, which is actually a very, very complex thing. So if we do that, we'll win. So how do you do that? If you're a tiny little company, and you, you know, you're thinking big, like, um, you know, that was suggested that it's equally as difficult to win if you think big or if you think small. Uh, so if you think big, how do you win against the big players where you don't have the channels, you don't have the money and all that? So here is, here is the strategy that, uh, that we chose and hopefully it will work, but you know, time will tell. So there are three pillars, you know, if this is like an island that uh, we call it a treasure island, right? That, you know, if we win that island, we become a new VMware. Um, there are control points around it. And so if we control just these three control points, I believe we have a chance to win against the HPs and Microsofts and all those other guys. So what are those control points? Number one is we need to show and execute the future roadmap to kind of show how this platform is going to look like because it's not here today, but everybody wants it. So if we can show and explain it to the world, right, and explain it to the analysts, explain it to the community, explain it to large customers, and then attract players like Intel and AT&T and others to help us to build this in the community for free, because then we'll have sufficient resources, that vision will become a reality. Number two is we have to win big customers, really, really big. Why big customers? Why wouldn't we go after you know, a small 20 people cloud somewhere? Because first of all, big customers are those who care about you know, that multi-cloud world, multi-technology world. Um, Smaller customers, they usually have a very special use case. You give them a solution, they're happy. And there's plenty of large and small companies who can do that. But large companies like AT&T, they have many, many different technologies. They all need to work together. So our story to them is really, really compelling. Uh, number two is cloud is not built in a vacuum. Cloud is built on constantly evolving infrastructure that infrastructure innovators are continuously innovating. Now, if you are an innovator in infrastructure and you build a new storage product and you build a new networking product, who do you want to sell that to? Usually to those who will consume a lot of it, right? So AT&T is a very attractive target if you build a new networking platform or storage platform because they'll buy billions of that over many years, right? And if you sold 50 small customers, you really don't care. 
right? So if you start winning AT&Ts and making them successful, people like Cisco and AMC and Dell and others who want to sell to AT&Ts and Verizons and Reliances and Sberbanks and all those other big companies will actually take you very, very seriously. And if you go after the mid-market and you start competing with HPs and um, Red Hats in the mid-market, first of all, you would never know of all the deals that are happening there, and secondly, you'll just lose, right? So you'll just die by a thousand cuts and get nowhere, whereas here, you as a small company with a couple hundred million dollar balance sheet, which is very, very small when you compete with HP, you can actually succeed. So, and, you know, this is, um, you know, specifically, you know, what's happening today. So we are... Uh, you're working with Intel and Ericsson and AT&T and SAP and Fujitsu because these are the people who believe that this is the vision that needs to happen because otherwise Amazon is going to win. We have won many dozens of very, very large companies and I've, I've shared some of those names, you know, the AT&Ts, the Verizons, you know, Wells Fargo Bank, Thomson Reuters, uh, Reliance in India, which is, I think, 3% of India's GDP. Um, you know, Shenzhen Stock Exchange, the largest um, financial cloud in China, many of those. And you know what? What's happening is the Cisco's of this world are making rounds and they're looking at who's building clouds. And they go and they see Mirantis here and Mirantis there and Mirantis whatever. And, you know, they go to AT&T and say, how can we sell our latest software-defined network to you? And they say, well, talk to Mirantis. They're our platform. So we are now getting calls from... EMCs and Cisco's who are saying, guys, we would like to um, be part of your platform. And we say, well, you guys, you know the game. You've done it with Microsoft before. We're a platform. You're a hardware vendor. How do you certify? We give you a platform. You stand up a team. You put your thing. You certify your drivers. You keep them. You maintain them over two years. We'll certify you. You do it on your own dollar. We're not going to do it for you. And a year ago, that conversation was not possible because they would say, well, you, you know, you want to work with Cisco, we're Cisco, you're Mirantis, you have to pay for it. And we don't have the money to certify our platform on all of those things, so you have to create demand by winning that, oops, wrong button, you have to create demand by winning these large customers, and once there is demand, these people come to you. And it's a long game, takes money, patience, and a lot of faith, because ultimately, you're selling the future that doesn't exist. In the meantime, Amazons and Microsofts and Googles are just selling billions of dollars worth of stuff. And you're standing there, and you have VCs and people who put money on you, you know, putting pressure, and you just have to do it. And hopefully, it will converge. So that's pretty much my story, and that's what we're trying to do. Thank you so much, Alex. You've just heard a very interesting lesson in business strategy. And I hope each and every one of you will take the lesson and deploy it and build a huge company. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming here. Thank you, Alex. Thank you.